1925, the first cracks in the, in the system began to show up, that is, some of the retrenchments. The Ann Arbor City system was abandoned in February 1925, followed a few months later by the branch from Ypsilanti down to Saline. By 1927, they had cut the service back on the line from Wayne up to Plymouth and Northville to just a matter of one or two trips a day, and I'll get into that when we get into the slides. By 1929 in September, in fact the 4th of September, the passenger service through Wayne on Michigan Avenue was discontinued. About nine days later they pulled off the freight service. The reason being they had to uh, pick up all the cars that were in various sidings and things of this sort. It took a few days longer to get the freight operation closed down than did the passenger service. I think with that I'll start with the slides. Tom, if you can uh, hit that switch. We've got to get a plug in for our book. Where do you focus it, Dick? Uh, you can focus off of the, uh, the, the, uh, the switch. Hang on. Right now. Okay, if you'll hit the, the, next, the next slide. All right, this was a map of the Detroit United system at its greatest extent. I made a color map out of it so that we can identify it by division. The green line was what they call the DJ and C, the Detroit, Jackson, and Chicago, which was a later name. They ran the line from Detroit through Wayne to Ypsilanti with a branch down to Saline, through Ann Arbor to Jackson, and also from Wayne up to Northville. They also ran a line down to Toledo, Briefly, they ran the service on the Canadian side in and out of Windsor. That didn't last very long, about 20 years or so. They also ran a line down to Wyandotte and Trenton. They ran one out Grand River to Farmington, which had a connection to Northville, and also up to Pontiac. The line to Pontiac went literally straight out Woodward Avenue. Then you had the branch up to Flint and up to Inlay City. Then there was a line that went out Gratiot Avenue and eventually up to Port Huron. And then there was a line along the lake shore here and in, uh, in, through the uh, Gross Points. Okay, if I can go to the next slide, please. Now the route that the uh, line to Wayne and, and Ann Arbor took, the main interurban station was at Bates and Jefferson from 1915 on. It would be approximately where the Ford Auditorium is downtown right now, within a couple hundred feet of it. The line, of course, went right out Michigan Avenue uh, using Griswold and looped down by the river and went around. It changed routes over the years, but basically that was the, the pattern. <coughs> Next. This was the interurban terminal. Some of you perhaps remember this. I don't know. This was down at Jefferson and Bates. The, uh, the interurbans loaded in the street. The waiting room was on the ground floor, and the other floors were different departments, claim departments, uh, auditing departments, and so forth and so on. Next. This is a, a view of Jefferson Avenue. Uh, I love that Mack truck right here. Uh, with the, uh, this was the interurban terminal right in here. Most of the interurbans went uh, up uh, Bates Street. But this was typical of the traffic in downtown Detroit in the 20s. I don't think you'll see it like that now. Next. Now this is a map of the line from Detroit out to Wayne. Uh, it, like I say, came right out Michigan Avenue. At one time, the city limits were at what they called Addison. And they put up a, a, a switch or a Y, they called Addison Y. Continued on out through Dearborn. Cross Telegraph Road and on out into Wayne. Now, except for the portion of the track in Detroit, the DJMC was essentially a single track railroad with switches every so often. And a few times the switches didn't work, as I'll show you in a few minutes. Huh? Now, this, we're back in downtown Detroit momentarily. This is an interurban that's come in from uh, Jackson and Wayne. He's going to turn and go down Griswold Street, will loop around and eventually go on back. But this is right at the corner of, J of uh, Griswold and uh, Michigan. Next. 
This, believe it or not, is Michigan and Miller Road, 1910. The next slide, Tom, about uh, 12 years later, about 1912, about 1926, the very same location. You notice the streetcar tracks are in the center. That part of the street was not paved. Uh, the uh, little hump in the back here is where the uh, streetcars went over the railroad. The next slide, please. This is probably what you recognize more. This was done by about 1928. Uh, the basic difference now, of course, is the car tracks are gone, and uh, this is all paved in later. This picture actually was taken on September 1st, 1929, just four days before the end of urban was abandoned. Okay. Now, this was the a typical interurban car that ran between uh, Detroit, Wayne, Ann Arbor, and Jackson. Many of them came out just to Wayne. The station was, of course, just kitty corner from here. There's a model of it right over here, a very well done model. Nick, uh, what do they use for signal on those? A bell or a horn? Uh, oh, usually, uh, usually a horn for, uh, for the major crossings, and bells, of course, for signals between the motorman and the conductor. The bell be on the front? The bell would be on the front, yes. What's that there? That's a headlight. Right? That's the headlight, yeah. Some of them, in, in later models, they had a little string that went up to the motorman, and there was a dimmer on it, like a little shade he could lower. <laughs> so that when at night it wouldn't blind you. You can imagine what that headlight would do to an automobile. It would just blind you. It'd be like looking into the sun. So they had these little shades they could raise and lower, just like rollers would. Okay, the next slide, Tom, please. Now, this is a, a planned view of a typical interurban car. Now, the, the yellow area, these are the seats in the basic car itself, non-smoking. The pink seats up here, I just chose colors so they would show up. They weren't pink by any matter. This was the smoking section. So what you have on buses and airplanes today, there's no smoking in smoking sections. That's nothing new. The pink area in the back was the heater where they could heat the car. Sometimes that was hot water heating. And then in the very corner back there was the, was the lavatory. Uh, usually you entered from the rear and you could exit through the front. The motorman stood up here. The conductor usually was in the back. How, how, how many could, could one hold? Uh, this particular model could hold about 50 to 60. Probably 200 on a, on a holiday. They would just hang on the and the back platform sometimes could be used for, for smokers also. That quite frequently was an open platform. But the, the basic seating was around 50 to 60. Next one, Tom. Now this is an interior view of the car. This is the you can see the partition here. There was a door that closed. Here was your seats for the smoking section. This was the main body of the car, and back here was the heater and, and the john. You're looking from the front towards the back of the car. Okay. Again, this is one of the typical cars that they ran between Detroit and uh, Wayne. This was what they called the Duffield Barn. Now, the Duffield would be about where the George Washington Carver building was on uh, Michigan Avenue. There's where Michigan swings from West Dearborn over to the railroad track. They just put up a, a motel here not too long ago. This, believe it or not, is along Michigan Avenue. You're looking west here. He's going into Detroit. Okay. This you may recognize. This is Michigan and Monroe. This pointy roof building is still standing. Yeah, and uh, the car is heading for Detroit. In later years, they finally double-tracked all this portion into here. The original station was over to the right. Okay. This was the Dearborn Station. I don't know what in the world happened, but they had a broken window. <laughs> and this was where the Edison office is now in West Dearborn, just a couple doors west of Monroe. Okay. This is the Westwood stop. Apparently there was an amusement park or something at one time. I'm sort of Johnny come lately to Wayne. Was there not some kind of an amusement park or something around Westwood? Yeah, well, this was one of the... I'm sorry? Dance hall. Dance hall. Okay, all right. You're talking to somebody who moved here in 46, and this was all at once by that. 
Yeah, this was one of the major stops, though, on the line. It generated a lot of business well, there. Okay, <laughs> Don, thank you. Next. Now, this is uh, right in front of Eloise Hospital. The car is coming out from Detroit, so he is going west on what is now the eastbound lanes of Michigan Avenue. The, uh, the lake or lagoon or whatever is over here, and then the railroad, uh, Michigan Central is back there, and you can see the station right alongside the car. The next slide, I'll have a close-up of the station. Yeah, that's the Eloise Depot right here. Then the next one is also in the same location, but it shows the buildings uh, on Eloise property itself. Lake. This body of water doesn't look like that anymore, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next few shots will be in Wayne, but first I've got this map. Now, can everybody see this red line? Okay, the red, the single red line represents the single track that I was speaking of. There was a place here just not too far from Howell Road. They had a switch they called Curtis Switch. Then it was single track, the station was right here on the southeast corner of Wayne Road in Michigan. And then just beyond where Newburgh would be was what they called the Austin Switch. They did start to build a bypass around Wayne, but it, it was never finished. The Michigan Central Station was right here, just a few blocks from the interurban station. And at one time the Pier Marquette Railroad had a little station there right by the junction. Then, of course, the branch up to Plymouth, uh, one up straight up Wayne Road. Okay. Now, here's Wayne, uh, downtown Wayne. The interurban station is right over here on the left. Car heading for Detroit. If you look very carefully, you can see just the rear end of a car heading up towards uh, Plymouth. Occasionally, the cars from Plymouth would go all the way into Detroit. Yeah. Wayne was the second busiest station on the DJ and C. They had 40 cars a day each way during the height of the of the operation. Ypsilanti had an equal amount and that was because they had the branch that ran down to Saline. What the cars run with? Electricity. Electricity. Yeah, 600, uh, 600 volts DC. There's a bunch building in the background there. Yeah. No hounds. And now on the far side of the of the interurban station, there was a little section there for freight. There was a spur that went in, and there was, they actually had a freight in there too. See that little building right there, or a little shed there by the pole? Yeah. What are those? They show up in a lot of the pictures. That's a different locations. That's what call. That was a call box. That was the yeah. uh, where the where the car when he got to the. Got to there, he would call in and get his orders for his next stop. But I tell you, everything was single track. He had single track now from here all the way into around Schaefer Road, with maybe about six places where the tracks uh, had switches on. Okay, Tom, next one. Here's a close-up of the station. Now, this is after it had been enlarged, and they were able to make a larger substation out of this. So this is a, a little later view than the first one. There was, yeah, this was somebody was interested in this house. I don't know what to suggest. I'm sorry. Barney. Oh, okay. Yeah, there was somebody who was very interested in that house more than they were. All right, Tom. The next one, please. Now here's uh, Michigan Avenue, west of uh, west of Wayne Road. You can see now they have. Paved it on both sides except for the car track itself. They have not paved that area. Now you'll notice, notice one thing. Even though it's single track, they had two strands of overhead wire. That was a very common practice on the DUR. Eastbound would use one wire and the westbound cars would use the other. The theory being it cut down on the wear and tear of one wire. So it was a, a very typical um, operation for the Detroit. Now, other interurban companies around this country did it too, but this was probably as big an example as, uh, as it was. Vic, do you have a picture of the uh, uh, turnaround spot up next to the cemetery? No. 
Now I just put this in. We're not going to go all the way to Ypsilanti and in Ann Arbor. I just wanted to show that uh, what we are going to do is next. The few, next few scenes will be from Wayne out to around Denton. I think you'll get a kick at least out of the one slide. Okay, Tom, you open. All right. Okay. First is a timetable. Now, does this commercial hotel with this Black Schmidt does that mean anything to anybody? It's a. This is a 1902 timetable. Commercial probably making seven dollars a week in those days too. But this was one of the earliest timetables that we've been able to come across. As a matter of fact, they have this is at the Ypsilanti Historical. I borrowed it from them to make copies of. But it was dated April. Well, the original one was April 1902. This is July 1902. The next slide is the other side of this. It actually shows the schedules. I don't know how well it shows up, but. Uh, it, it lists uh, Detroit, Dearborn, Wayne, Eloise, I'm sorry, Easter, Eloise, Wayne, Canton, Denton, and Atlanta. How much did it cost to ride? Probably in these days, probably about a cent a mile. Uh, the fares varied. You could get all kinds of bargain fares. You could buy mileage, mileage coupons, uh, like 500 miles. You'd probably pay $5 for the 500 miles. And then if you're going to go 12 miles or so, the conductor would tear 12 of these little coupons off. Uh, a round-trip ticket would be uh, cheaper than, than, a, than two one-ways. Uh, they had family plans and stuff, even in those days. The, the fare was very, very uh, fluid, so to speak, but uh, usually it ran around a cent to a cent and a quarter a mile back in this era. When you get up into the 1920s, it got up to almost to three cents a mile. Next one, Tom. Now you heard me talk about the Curtis switch and the Austin switch. 7092 was heading for Wayne. The other one was going towards Ypsilanti. He should have waited at Austin switch and didn't. So. Uh, this happened between Austin Switch and, uh, and the uh, Pier Marquette Railroad. This happened about 1927. Uh, there were a few people injured, but there were no fatalities. There weren't too many riding the Endurban by that time. Tom, the next one is a, is a little bit better view of it, perhaps. You see, he really telescoped it. Yeah. He really did a number on it. You see there, this is one of the open platform types, where a lot of people go up and on the back platform and just smoke. Next one, Tom. Now this is one I got from uh, your files, Hank. This slide, uh, this picture. And uh, this is, we don't know exactly, but we know it's between Wayne and, uh, and Denton, as is the next one, I think. Uh, maybe somebody recognize it. Um, both of these are right along Michigan Avenue, west of Wayne. The next one, I think you may get a kick out of. This was made, this was made from a, a postcard, and somebody faked in the airplane. <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's the Canton stop, but it, it is Denton. Yeah. yeah, the house. No, I, uh, I'm wrong. That's Sheldon. That's Sheldon. You're right. That's Sheldon. Russell House. Sheldon. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Sheldon. Yeah. They refer to it as a Canton stop. It's actually Sheldon. Yeah, that's the old store. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Notice the uh, horse and buggy over there. Huh? Yeah. Okay, Tom, the next one. Those please. airplanes are looking for Willow Run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the Yankee Air Force, we're in trouble. Yeah. Okay, this is a, a map of the branch that ran from Wayne on up towards uh, Plymouth and Northville. They went up Wayne Road, Cherry Hill, <laughs> Newburgh, Ann Arbor Trail. It crossed the Pier Marquette at grade three times inside of Plymouth. Then it had a real fancy underpass north of there, and then went out and up in, into uh, Northville. Then you could make connections at Northville and go on up to Farmington, and if you were really adventuresome, you could go all the way to Pontiac up Orchard Lake Road. Okay? This was the original type of equipment that ran on the line from Wayne up to Plymouth. They're little single truck cars, and when it was nice and dry and no hills, they could do real good. But if it got wet and the rails got slippery, they just sat there and hummed. They didn't really make too much progress. 
So it wasn't long before they decided to make them a little bit bigger. Tom, if you'll flip it. So they took two of those old ones and spliced them together and made this rather unhandsome vehicle. But the DPNN was Detroit, Plymouth, and Northville. This definitely was guaranteed to keep cows off the track and what was in the village. Tom, next one. Down. Now this you probably uh, recognize. Somebody said this was one of your city officials at one time. The <laughs> gentleman with the new hair. Oh, okay. The officials Now this is my favorite car for several reasons, not the least of which, seven 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 seven, and they decaled it twice in the front, twice in the back, twice down each side, and two or three times inside. There's forty four sevens on this car. <laughs> Might be a good lotto number to try, yeah. I don't know. But now he is turning the corner. He is coming off of Wayne Road, and he is turning onto Michigan to go into Detroit. So he is turning the corner right at your main intersection. Okay. Now this is, believe it or not, is on Newburgh Road, about where Warren would be. It was called King Road, or the big farm there, the King, King Farm. This is the body of an old car, and because it was a large dairy farm, they set this car up to accommodate milk cans, these big five-gallon milk cans that the uh, interurban cars would pick up. Next one, Tom. Now this one, there's been a little debate as to the no, exact there isn't. location. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. It's agreed that this is Newburgh Road up That's by Clyde Smith. Up by Clyde Smith. Okay. Yeah. And it's still out there. Maybe wants to compare. The, it looks the same. The house looks the yeah. same. But there was some strong uh, <coughs> indication that this was along Wayne Road. But uh, yeah. no, no I, I don't think so either. I haven't actually having looked at the house. But you can <laughs> see what real sturdy construction they had on that car track. Oh yeah. If they had Dramamines in those days, you probably should have used them. <laughs> the next one, Tom. This is at the corner of Newburgh and Ann Arbor Trail, the south of the west corner of that intersection. I think there's a church called the Lord's House, I think, yeah. on the northeast corner. This would be on the opposite side. And this little, this little station is still in existence. It's now up at Greenmead, up at the Livonia Historical Society. They've kept the building intact. So the car on the right, he's heading for Plymouth. The car 7785, he's going to make a right turn and eventually wander on down into Wayne. Okay. Now the route through Plymouth, it crossed the railroad at grade right here, it crossed it at grade here, and it crossed it at grade here. The interurban station was right off of the uh, right off the corner of Kellogg Park there. Um, Big bank on the corner and the end of the urban station right behind it. Okay. <coughs> this is in Plymouth. You're right in front of the uh, what's the theater? The Tenement? Yeah. The Tenement yeah. Theater would be right across. This is Kellogg Park, and that's Main Street back there, yeah. So he is heading for he is heading for Wayne. Okay. Now he has come, this car is sitting on Main. He's going to come towards us and swing right down alongside the theater. And this uh, marquee here is for the depot. The interurban station was on Main Street, <coughs> just a uh, hundred feet up from Kellogg. Some of those buildings are probably yeah, still there. Yeah, one is a dress yeah. shop yeah. or something. Okay. Now just north of, uh, just north of Plymouth, they had what they call the Phoenix Tunnel. So here it crosses the railroad in grade three times, and then just north there they put this fancy uh, underpass. Now both of them are heading towards Northville. So the steam train on the PM and the, the interurban itself, they're both heading towards, I don't know who will get there first, but uh, okay. This is between uh, Plymouth and Northville. And you may recognize the next one even more. That's, I think, a little bit more identifiable. This is uh, at the, right at the point where Edward Hines Drive crosses, right in the back here. See the car track right along the edge of the lake. Phoenix. Hello, Phoenix Lake. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ford points right on the left side. Yes, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Right. 
The next slide is, I think, is a mystery. We don't know exactly what they're trying to prove here. They're, they're too well dressed to be uh, workers. I, I have a feeling, it's just a theory, but uh, the automobile uh, owners, I think, sometimes got out on their own and kind of fixed the roads up so they could uh, drive their cars out. This probably predates the auto club or whatever. But uh, we are using it as much to show the the typical interurban construction between Northville and Plymouth as anything else. But uh, it's an interesting picture. You say they're they're pretty well dooded up there. Maybe they're the, breaking ground for something. It could very well be, but I say I just have a feeling they're they're, they're figuring in potholes or something. I I kind of get that feeling, but uh, there's too many shovels to be. <laughs> okay. Of course, there may have been horses just went by there, too. You know, right? <laughs> okay, now in Northville, the interurban from Wayne and Plymouth came up, came up to this point, turned up, and then he backed up about three blocks. Tried doing that in downtown Northville with eight. So, uh, and then the cars coming in from Farmington, they would do the reverse. They would come in, back up this way, and they, too, would back up. And uh, at one time, there was a big bandstand right in the main corner there of Sheldon Road and Main. So the interurban station was actually beyond the end of the track. Tom, this is the car coming in from Plymouth now. He's coming over the mill pond, and he'll be making his turn and heading on into Northville from there. <coughs> now, this is looking east on Main Street. This interurban has already done his turning and he has backed up towards the end of the track is right about in here. You see the baggage truck over here that they put the Mail and Express on. So this was probably taken from the middle of the intersection at Sheldon and, uh, and Main. Okay. Now here is just the reverse angle. Here's the two cars. Now you're looking west on Main. And one of these cars, this one is going to Wayne, and this one back here is going to go to Farmington. I think this is a kind of a mini mall of some sort in here now. Is that kind of a historical district? Thing? No. Okay. Then we have a kind of an unusual little thing here. This is a single truck funeral car. Um, back in the uh, in the heyday of the interurban systems, uh, it was not uncommon for a traction property to have a car that was designed to take the coffin and then the members of the of the family could ride along. So uh, you can see here this one car has already turned around and heading back. Uh, and they're either putting the hearse onto the car or taking it off. It's just a little single truck car. They must have had fun and games getting out there. Okay. Now the interurban did some advertising. They tried to uh, stimulate business by telling them take the interurban to to take the football game. This is about 1927 or so. Okay. Okay, Tom. Okay. Now it wasn't long until the interurbans began to feel the pinch of the the automobiles and the. Uh, buses and all that. So in in May of 28, in the newspapers, they began talking about many of the interurban lines going to be discontinued. And it was just a little over a year later when the B, J, and C did go out. But the in 19 early 1928, the Jackson line to Wayne was separated from the DUR. They went into receivership came out as a new company called the Eastern Michigan Railways. The line to Jackson was not included in that little package and it became the property of another line who turned right around and abandoned it within a year. Next one. Yeah, these are our newspaper uh, clippings that we took out of uh, the official scrapbooks. And this is August of 29. This one is actually after abandonment. September 5th, that's already quit. So all these are notices that the line is quitting or just has quit. Okay. This is an interurban leaving the um, downtown Detroit station on the last day of service. 
we don't know if it's the last car, but it is on the last day. This was leaving Bates Street on September 4th, 1929. About six weeks later, the DSR extended their Michigan Avenue line out to Mason in Dearborn. And then a few weeks later, extended it out to Telegraph. They put a loop in right across to the Dearborn Theater. But you notice the automobile here, he's got the kind of a integrated headlights, one black and one white. But this was uh, about the uh, 10th of October of 1929, which was just a couple of weeks before the Depression started, stock market crash, and they only, DSR only ran out to Telegraph about a year or so, and they gave up and quit. And they cut it back to Schaefer. What kind of car that was in that picture? I don't know. I'm not that much of an automobile connoisseur. I really don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> Sure, well, could I say it's a look? It looks like an early day Edsel with, <laughs> with the uh, Detroit air cooler. Detroit air cooler. Made Wayne. Made Next one, Tom. This was uh, actually at Michigan and Mason in West Dearborn. They were celebrating the, the uh, remember the old restaurant called the Bungalow of West Dearborn? The Y was right in next to that. You know? Okay, Tom, the next. Okay, now this is the notices that about 10 days later they cut out the freight service. September 12th, September 12th. This is when they got rid of the freight. All the notices in the paper. I think all four articles are the same, but they had different newspaper headings, so I printed them all. Okay, finally. Then when the freight service quit, an outfit, the trucking outfit called the Southern Michigan Transportation took over, and they began sorting all the industries and online plants that the interurban was taking care of. And this is also on the 2nd of, of September of 29. So it was a notice that when the interurban quits, the trucks are going to take over. Okay? Now maybe you remember the Detroit Motor Bus Company. Oh, yeah. Okay? This is a 1926 map showing all their suburban operations, and they were running buses out to Wayne at the same time the interurban was running. They also ran a bus out Ford Road. They also ran a bus to Plymouth. They also ran a bus to Northville. So you could go directly from Detroit to Northville or Plymouth without having to go to Wayne and transfer, which made it a big convenience for those that were going in that general direction. The dotted line shows that I think I have something more proposed. They were going to run the bus further over down to Belleville. But you can see here with the with the advent of the bus coming in, that was not doing the interurban any good. You had buses and interurbans running on the same street. Okay. Maybe you remember these double deckers. This was one that uh, was celebrating something called Dearborn Day in uh, Dearborn at that time. Solid rubber tires. Okay, next one. Now this uh, was Dearborn Coach. This had been a uh, Detroit Motor Bus vehicle, and when they were forced off the streets, Dearborn Coach Company was formed, and this was in the garage at uh, Oakman and Ford Road. Okay. I don't remember these running, but maybe some of you have seen these. I don't recall this particular style. But, uh, Looks like a Ford. Yeah, I think it was, and then it says, courtesy will prevent accidents, is what it says right here. Next one. Now uh, this, I think, is a, is a gem. Note the roll stockings kind of reminds you of Mama's family. Mama's family. This was 1937, and this is now where Montgomery Wards is, right here. This is the Chamber Mish, and this is Montgomery Wards. This was built by Garwood. This bus was a Garwood coach. Okay. This was what they were running when I first moved to Wayne in 1946. This type and some others a little bit newer than that, okay? Maybe you remember the bus station that was out here on West Michigan. Greyhound pulled up in front of it. 
And then all these Deerbring buses, uh, this was taken from a postcard. Also, there was a Northville coach company. Does anybody remember that? Sure. I rode it up to Plymouth a couple times. They used to circle in front of this thing, too. They never went in the lot, though. Okay, one more time. Now, this is a little bit more modern time, and this white slab here in the middle of the street was where the interurban car track was. And when I moved to Wayne in 46, this was still very evident that uh, the car track, you know, you can see it ran right up the middle. I just cut up the tracks and just laid a new slab of concrete in them. Okay? Now it says that's all, but can I show you six more slides or have sure. I put you to sleep already? No. Okay, and the next one then, Tom. This will, this will go quick. This I took right out of our book. We call it Ann Arbor's Biggest Bank Deposit, and you'll see why in just a minute. The DUR, or Eastern Michigan at that time, used to run freight trains at night. They were not permitted to run them during the day hours, but they would run them from like 10 o'clock until 5 in the morning or whatever. So on the night of August 5th, 1927, a freight train pulled by a freight motor and about six cars was coming up Packard, up Main, turned on Huron, went by the station, went under the railroad. And then if you're familiar with Ann Arbor at all, this is a long upgrade. I mean, it's about a mile and a half. Mm -hmm. Then up here was a switch where cars could pass. He was having problems. One of the one of the motors was not operating properly, and as he's grinding up this hill, the crew decided they were going to unload about three of the cars and set them on the siding, take the other three cars up on the level ground, come back and pick these up and take them on. That's what they call doubling the hill. It's a very common practice. If the motor's power is underpowered and they can't do what they're supposed to, they'll set some cars off, run with part of them, come back, get them, couple them on, away they go. Only one problem, the cars ran away. And they broke loose and they started roaring down oh this God. hill, <coughs> went under this overpass here, shot by the depot here, and instead of turning, went right into that bank. And I mean it went right in and through the bank. The next three or four slides, Tom. Oh, there it is. Yeah, where's the money? Now, we've got copies of the original um, papers that went with this. They're the reasons that this happened. I you suppose you could call them alibis or excuses, but uh, the official reasons as to what, what happened. And it included the uh, crew's uh, analysis of whether any of this equipment was repairable or not. A couple of them they said were, a couple of them they said were not. You want to hit the next move? They're all pretty much the. Oh, oh my. You see, they, they did a they did a mess. Now, like in a couple of cases, they were able to salvage the trucks, perhaps some of the air hoses or something of that sort. But they scrapped two of the cars right on the spot. They just said there's no point in even trying to haul them away. They just junked them right then and there. Next one, Tom. Some of these, you see, this is a wooden trailer. You can see the, the planking here. We had steel underframes. Some of the cars were steel. I think there was two steel and four wooden ones. And you can see the kindling wood that they've made here. Okay, the next one. Now you figure for 1927, the night photography wasn't too bad on some. See, this trailer they were able to hang on to, and I think they were able to uh, rescue these two. Okay, a couple of days later, after they got the mess cleaned up, next slide, Tom. This was the scene. Now, interestingly enough, on the original slide, there is a sign on this thing here that says, Do Not Litter, which I, I thought was kind of a